Hello, everybody, and welcome to this event where we're hosting Paul Gibbons, the author of The Science of Successful Organizational Change. My name is JP Manti. I work in culture and change here at Microsoft. And I had the pleasure of uh, reading Paul's book and reaching out to Paul to try and ask him how some of his ideas might help us in our culture change here at Microsoft. And so that led to a series of extremely valuable and interesting conversations and connected with Amy Draves to be able to host Paul here. So the, the really great thing from my perspective, um, as somebody who geeks out on a lot of this culture stuff, I read a lot of books, a lot of research, I follow a lot of experts. Um, Paul's book and, and his thinking really influenced and changed the way I think about culture change and um, systems that drive human flourishing. And so it's a real honor and privilege to have Paul here today. Please welcome Paul Gibbons. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, JP. And, and thanks, Amy, for making this happen. And thanks to Microsoft. I'm, I'm having, I have to come clean, I'm having a kid in a candy store experience. You know, I've grown up, I grew up uh, programming with computers and playing with computers. And Microsoft's been part of my life albeit I was in Europe and so you're 6,000 miles ago, it was a little inconvenient, but part of, uh, part of my life for one way or the other for almost 40 years or 35 years now. How old is Microsoft, by the way? 1979, was it? 30, 39 years old? Fabulous. It's great to be here. Um, I, uh, I wrote this book, and I hope you'll avail yourself of one of the discounted copies. And if you can't do that, I hope you avail yourself of one of the very, very expensive copies that are on sale afterwards. I had an argument with my publisher. Um, I submitted this book in uh, the end of 2013. And uh, she called me up one afternoon. She said, uh, I've got some bad news for you. I want you to take out a section. And so at great personal risk, I'm going to put that section into this talk because I think it's something that I want to say that she felt would be too controversial. So perhaps it may or may not be controversial to you. And the title uh, of the section was, Is All This Talk About Happiness Making Us Miserable? So uh, everywhere you look, we have uh, happiness screaming at us from the bookshelves in Barnes & Noble with smiling people with beautiful smiles and tans, both telling us that happiness is important and also telling us how to get it. And uh, I don't think that either of those two things are necessarily true. There are lots of ways to define the value of a life. The Greek philosophers talked about virtues. And the good life is being the virtuous life. Now, that sounds very moralistic today. But they didn't mean moralism in, in the sense that we might use it today. They meant courage, prudence, temperance, piety, rationality and reason, freedom, friendship. Those were the things to the Greeks that were constitutive of the good life and not being happy. And so I, I invite us to conduct a, a thought experiment. Does someone summiting Everest, are they happy? Is that the, way you, the first thing you think of? Did Mother Teresa organize her time around being happy? Nelson Mandela? Environmental activists who are trying to make the world a better place, at least in their mind. Are they, are they happy? Is that how they think about things? What about a school teacher? What about the parent of a sick child or caring for a sick friend? Does that make people happy? And so by narrowly defining the good life in terms of happiness, I think, and this is one contribution also from the Greeks, is the more you try and seek happiness, the more unhappy you'll be. And one of the things I do say in the book I think is quite entertaining, there's no more guarantee of unhappiness is comparing yourself to someone and thinking that you ought to be happier, that they're happier than you or you ought to be as happy as them. So I think it's an error, and um, we have good news, though. Um, the uh, psychologists in the last 15 years uh, of uh, the 21st century, if you want, um, have come up with a notion that's really close to what the Greeks did 2,500 years ago, and it's called human flourishing. Now, how many people have heard of human flourishing? Is that, uh, and it, it's made its way into the... Of course, the OD consultants all have. All the hands got shut up in the air. So perhaps this will be uh, of some interest. Um, human flourishing is the notion that, uh, yes, happiness is important, but you don't get happy by focusing on happiness. So there are four other dimensions to human flourishing as contemporary psychologists think of it. One of them is spiritual fulfillment, but that effectively means doing meaningful work, work that matters, work that makes a difference. The second thing 
is doing work that engages you fully, that uses the maximum of your human capabilities. The third thing is having nurturing and productive relationships. Nothing predicts well-being and wellness more than having great relationships. The Harvard Health Study, one of the largest cohorts ever studied, that was the predictor of longevity and wellness rather than other outcomes. And so, um, and then finally achievement. We're human beings. We are drawn to achieve, to climb the Everest, to go to the moon, to build corporations and cathedrals. That's one of the things we do. And so if you look at all five of those dimensions, you begin to get a rounder picture of what the good life might be. So this is a talk about uh, business and it's a talk to business people. And so why do I mention that? Is that the question I have, and I think is a question I'm dissatisfied with the answer, is that is work and workplaces as currently designed, are they designed to promote human flourishing? Is that one of the things that we take seriously when we build corporations today? And the answer is I don't think we do. I, don't, I think people, as human beings, one of the things that makes work valuable is that it has special meaning for us. Do we design workplaces around meaning for people? Do we design workplaces so that people are maximally engaged? So that we're using 80, 90%, 100%, 110% of what people are capable? The exhilaration of using all of yourself. One psychologist, a guy called Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, the most unpronounceable name in psychology, Hungarian name, defined flow experience. You know, uh, uh, sports athletes talk about being in the zone. Chess players talk about being in the zone when the ball is this big. So he defined flow experience as when you're using so much of your own capacities, the world disappears. It almost becomes a, a meditation or zen-like. So maximal engagement. And then are we designing workplaces for relationships, for networks and communities? Are we designing workplaces where politicking and infighting and, you know, we design workplaces that are deleterious to the formation of human resources. Are we designing workplaces so that human beings can achieve things that matter to them? And I think largely the answer is no. Largely we design businesses with other things in mind. And so one provocation I have is that we ought to be thinking more about designing businesses around human flourishing. So the three more, if you'll permit me a little bit more of a philosophical digression before I go into science and organizational change, which is, as we say in England, what it said on the tin, so my, my further philosophical digressions are, <clears throat> if that's one thing that we ought to design businesses around is human flourishing, here's three more. Uh, the thing that I love most in life is science. I think science is one of the f things that dignifies human civilization. Science, art, we can name a few other things. And unfortunately, science by itself without business would stay in the laboratory bench or in obscure journals that no one ever reads. Business, to my mind, if we, insofar as we're able to bring technology and science for the betterment of human beings, the 7.4 billion on the people, it's businesses who perform that role. And that, to me, is a sacred role. That, to me, is the sacred, the job that businesses does, scaling science and technology. Um, the other thing, and this is a notion that comes from Mark, Karl Marx, who's not the most read management thinker in the canon, not terribly popular in the United States. Although Donald Trump, I'm sure, is considering adopting some of his philosophies. Probably not. So, um, uh, so he had the notion, check this out as a notion, that work was what dignified us as human beings. And there was enormous dignity, not just in working, though, in working together. That's what we did incredibly specially and differently as human beings, is come together to create magical, wonderful things that none of us can do by ourselves, And in our culture, unfortunately, we glorify the individual rather too much. And we don't think about to do anything of any value in a complex world today, for the most part, you need, you need gangs of people, whether it be cathedrals or computers or the International Space Station or the internet or whatever it is. So workplaces ought to be places where human beings can come together to create magic that we can't do by ourselves. And then, the, and then the final thing is businesses, and this is my great hope for the 21st century, ought to be do things that are of value to humankind. So when I think about um, that, one of, the, one of the things I think about is if we, had a, if we had an individual, if you had a very dear friend who was brilliant and talented, and you saw them wasting their life with trivi the trivial and the mundane. 
It would be really disappointing to you, would it not? Well, as I look at, uh, if you look at human civilization, if you take that a step further, if you look at what we do as a civilization, with all the talent and the brilliance and the energy and the vision and the imagination of which humans are capable, and you look at the things on which we squander some of our intellectual resources, are we working on the right things? Do we need thousands of people to design a new kind of toothpaste? Yeah. Do we need all of the heart, all of the economic energy and all the vitality of our civilization? Is enough of that pointed towards things that increase human flourishing, human well-being around the world? And I think the answer is clearly no. And we ought to be able to, and this is a great hope for the 21st century, design economic structures, and that includes business, that promote human wellness, human flourishing in ways that we don't, and redirect our energy towards things that matter, and redirect our energy away from the trivial, away from the mundane, away from the banal, and away from the vulgar. I'm using that word and the word the way that Latins use it, the base, if you will. And so that's a great hope that I have. Um, and so with those philosophical reflections, and that was the bit that got struck from my book by the editor uh, all those 18 months ago, so I hope that wasn't, um, wasn't too tedious.